Dangerous faith. And uh, <clears throat> we've got a key scripture, so go ahead and get your Bibles ready. We're going to go straight into this. Dangerous faith. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 29 is our key scripture for the series. And um, let me just kind of set, set the pace for it as you turn there. Um, so last year, I was really going through something, and my faith was weak in a particular area. So when I'm weak in something, I go get strong. So I started studying and researching and studying the Word, and I came across um, Rick Warren teaching on uh, uh, faith. And, uh, and so it so marked me and so helped me in that moment that I came back to our pastoral team and I said, listen, in 2019, we're going to do a series on faith. I'm going to just tell you right now. And, uh, and I'm stealing half of what Rick Warren taught me. I'm just going to do it. And so much of what you'll hear through this series, you're like, man, I, Rick Warren did something like that. Absolutely. I've stole every bit of it. I just want to, I'm telling you, when somebody's got revelation, you just go ahead and go with it. Not to mention the fact he stole it from the Bible anyway. So it's all the same. If you've got your Bibles ready, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 29 is our key scripture. It says, according to your faith, will it be done? According to your faith, will it be done? Jesus has been approached by two blind men. He has just finished healing Jairus' daughter. She was or bringing her back to life. She was dead. And, uh, and then, um, uh, no, excuse me, just healing her. He had just finished healing the woman with the issue of blood. And it says that these, here in this passage, that these blind men begin to follow him around. And they begin to say, you know, heal us, heal us. They followed him into the house he was going into. And Jesus turns to them once they get inside the house. And he goes, do you believe I can do this? And they say, yes, we believe. And then he makes this statement, according to your faith, will it be done? Jesus sets a premise. He sets a doctrinal concept. He puts into play a rule, if you will, a spiritual rule. And that is, according to your faith, will it be done? What he's saying to them is like, he's saying, you get to choose how much you receive from me, according to your faith. You get to choose whether or not you receive a miracle or whether or not something great happens in your life by way of your faith. In other words, he's saying, you know, if you have a lot of faith, then you'll get a lot done and a lot of great things will happen. If you have a little bit of faith, you little bit of things will get done. And if you have no faith, nothing's going to happen because the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible. In fact, our whole journey as a believer is to learn to increase in our faith. Most, most people think I got saved and so I have faith. It was, it was like, like, you, like you were given it. That's not actually an accurate portrayer, portrayal of what faith is in our life. We have to con- constantly develop our faith. Why? Because our faith is constantly under attack. We almost called this series Bulletproof Faith. But I didn't want you to think that all we were doing is playing defense. But the enemy is constantly trying to steal your faith. Constantly trying to keep you from growing in faith. Because if with faith, Jesus said, like, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to a mountain, move. Go throw yourself into the ocean. And it will. That's what Jesus said. And so really, all of Christianity, all of our relationship with him really hinges on faith. It's this principle, it's this understanding, it's this characteristic of who God is and that you and I need to grow and learn in. In fact, I don't want to be a pastor who does not help his people grow into great faith. I want you to be the kind of men and women that when you walk in the room, all the demons go, ah, and run out. I want you to be the kind of Christian that when someone says, I, I think I'm having a heart attack, you go, in the name of Jesus, and it starts beating again. They go, oh, thank you so much. I, I want you to be like Jesus. And so what we have to do is grow and increase in our faith. See, each and every one of us have fear. It's true. Every one of us have fear. There are areas that you're not as fearful in, areas that you have real strong confidence or maybe faith in, and then areas that maybe you have great fear in. And really, it comes down to fear is really the result of placing our faith in something outside of Jesus. Let me give you an example. If you put your faith, you put your confidence in money, then guess what will happen? That creates a fear of not having money. If you put your confidence in your marriage relationship, you put your faith in that, oh man, he's always there, she's always there, that, then what that then does is you don't mean to, but that then creates a fear that he or she will not be there or that this marriage won't work or this relationship won't work. Friend, on the opposite of that, if you will put your faith in an immovable God, and the God of all gods, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, then you will never be shaken. Our faith is to be put in Christ. And as we put our faith, as we grow in that, and when you do that, you become dangerous. 
You become dangerous to the enemy. In fact, when we see Jesus is being tempted on the, on the mountainside by Satan, Satan was constantly trying to get Jesus to take his faith off of the Father and put it in Satan himself or in his own ability. And you and I have to learn to grow in our faith to a place that we become dangerous. Are you with me? Say yes. Here's my concern. I'm concerned that Christianity has become so weak, especially in the United States, that we never risk anything. And faith requires risk. It requires you to step out into a little bit of a danger zone, what you're not comfortable with. In fact, I'm worried that churches, and, and I don't want us to be this, either, that we try to make it so comfortable for everyone that no one ever has to step into faith. And Jesus said, I, I'm, I'm a rock that makes men stumble. Like, they've got to put their faith in me, and if they don't, it, it, it causes problems for them. And you and I want to live the kind of life that causes our heart to beat. We want to live the kind of life for Christ that, man, I don't know if this is going to work out, but I'm going to do it for God anyway. That is the dangerous faith that I'm trying to help you and I get to. Satan is scared of men and women with dangerous faith. So with that being said, I want to teach you today, as we start into the series, what is faith? What is faith? And so we're going to dive into uh, Hebrews chapter 11, which is considered like the hero of faith passage, okay? So in Hebrews chapter 11, it lists all these great men and women of the Bible and some of the great things they did, how they trusted, believed in God, how they moved in faith. And from that, I'm going to teach you six pieces of what faith is. Is that okay? Say yes. So if you got your phone, take it out, start taking notes. If not, write, write, on, write on your pad, write on your hand, write on your friend's hand. Doesn't matter to me. All right, number one, faith is believing when I do not see it. Faith is believing when I do not see it. Now, let's, let's sidebar for just a second. So somebody asked me the other day, they said, Pastor, I, 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 uh, um, I, I, I love your church, but, but what happened? I thought y'all were a shout back church. I said, we were, but all these white people started coming. So it really messed us up. Okay, so let me just help you. Today, while I'm preaching, if I say something really good, you go, I want you to shout out, amen, praise God, hallelujah. If I say something that hurts your feelings, you just say, thank you, Jesus. Just thank you, Jesus. All right, so let's start with number one. Faith is believing when I do not see it. There you go. Now you're with me. Come on, don't let me preach at you. Let's do it together. Faith is believing when I don't see it. Hebrews chapter 11, let's start in verse 1. It says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain for, of what we do not see. Faith is being sure of what I'm hoping for. I'm being sure even though I'm hoping for it. I don't see it yet, but faith is being sure that I, what I'm put, I put my faith in you, God, and I believe even though I don't see it, I believe that you're at work in this situation. That's faith. That's what faith is. See, we live in a culture that teaches us that uh, I'll believe it when I see it. See, man says, I'll believe it. I'll believe it when I see it. But God says, no, no, no. You will see it when you believe it. See, we say, no, no, I'm going to believe it when I see it. Like, all right, he said he's changed. I ain't going to believe it till I see it. And God said, no, 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 no. You got to believe to be able to see it. And so we get the cart in front of the horse, as the old people used to say. We, 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 get, to, we get to try to do, do this before we've ever done this. And Jesus says, clearly, you got to have faith in me. When you have faith in me, then you will see what you want to see. But you can't see that until faith comes first. Faith comes before the supernatural miracles that you and I are believing for. So faith is believing when I, do, when I don't even see it. Can I just explain something? Years ago, on the floor of my living room, there was a handful of people who got down on their face and said, God, we love you, and we know you want to do something in our life. And then he showed us you. We started this church in faith. We started this church with a handful of people in my living room. There, there was no church, there's no mega church that launched us and gave us half a million dollars. There was no, there was no you know, social media thing that we did to attract all of you to us. We did, all we did was say, God, what do you want for our life? And he said, we want you to, I want you to have a church in Cedar Hill called Church on the Hill. And then I want you to put a Church on the Hill campus every place in the metro. In fact, back up, I want you to put Church on the Hill ministry. I want Jesus to be glorified in every community, every living room, every house. And so he said, yes, sir, we'll do it. And we've been faithing that before you ever showed up. We saw you before you came here. Amen. In fact, a couple of you, I have been praying for you to come here. You say, well, Pastor, how, how, what do you mean? Well, I've been praying for sexy people to show up at our church, and it worked. <laughs> it's happening. You know it's you. Number two, faith is obeying when I don't understand it. That's faith. Faith is obeying when I don't understand it. Look at verse 7 
of Hebrews 11. It says, by faith, no one, when warned about things not yet seen. Remember that, things not yet seen. I'll explain in a second. No one, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. Noah built an ark. God came to him and said, I am going to destroy all the wickedness in the world. Every man and woman who will not put their faith in me will be removed from the planet. I'm going to start over with those who will believe in me. And Noah was the only one, he and his family. And God said, so I want you to build a ship. Noah asked him, what's a ship? Never seen one. Never seen one. Go study history. And God said, well, you're going to need that to float in the floodwaters. What's floating in floodwaters? I'm going to send rain over the earth. What's rain? He'd never seen it. See, scholars believe that there was like a canopy around the earth that, that the dew basically watered, if you will, or like uh, cared for. There was like a mist, if you will, that kept the sunlight, you know, uh, tempered so you didn't have as much of the rays and so forth and so on. And that after the flood, all that shifted. That, that, that literally the Bible says that the earth ripped open and the floodwaters came out from the bowels of the earth. And then from the heavenlies, the rain came down. And so, and so Noah built a ship, never seen a ship, built a ship in the middle of dry land, not next to an ocean, not next to a lake. Now, let me just say this to you. If you get out in Plano and start building a ship, we're going to have you, we're gonna have you, we're gonna have you put in, in, in jail somewhere as crazy. We're going we're gonna to call the crazy people and say, come get the crazy guy. Because there's, what do you, how do you think you're going to get it there? How, how, is, how are you going to get this giant ship? In fact, this ark, when you, when you go through the measurements, this ark was 510 feet long. That's almost two football fields. Then when God sent all the animals, the estimation is there was close to 75,000 animals on this ship. Never seen a ship. Never thought, never seen animals all just start showing up at your house. I mean, you guys keep getting raccoons, and if you live around here, you have coyotes around your house and stuff like that, but they're just here to eat, fight, you know, Fifi. And so, so be careful of that. But at the end of the day, Noah had never even seen or known what these things were. He obeyed God. And can I, guys, can I tell you this? He didn't obey him for one week. He didn't walk in faith for 10 years. A hundred years at least he worked on this boat. A hundred years. Now you think about that. Every new neighbor who moved into the neighborhood Knocks on the door, bringing cookies. Hi, we're the Smith family. Hi, how are you? Oh, it's good. What's that in your backyard? That's our dad. He's uh, building a ship. What's a ship? Well, he's, oh, you're all oh, y'all are going to die, and we're, we're going to live. And... I mean, picture him every time he comes into Home Depot. Like, you talk about awards cards. I mean, that dude is there every day. I need another 8 million nails. I mean, every day that guy is working on it for a hundred years. He didn't wake up and say, today, God, I'm going to believe in you. He woke up every day for a hundred years and say, I'm faithing this, even though I don't understand what we're doing or where we're going. Some of you will not have faith in God until you understand him. And he's saying, I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to let you get off with that. You've got to have faith in me, even if you don't understand. That's called faith, not logic, faith. Faith is believing even when I don't understand it. Look, number three, faith is giving when I don't have it. Faith is giving when I don't have it. It's not a faith gift if you've got plenty. It's a faith gift when you don't have it. Look at Hebrews 11:4. It's pointing it out there. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man. Why did his offering give evidence that he was a righteous man? I'll explain it in a second. And God showed his approval of his gifts. Whose gifts? Abel's, not Cain's. So if you go back and study the book of Genesis, God had instituted some type of you know, you know, yearly, monthly, weekly, whatever, come before me and show your gratitude, your thankfulness for the, all that I'm doing for you. It was, uh, God, you're in our life, and we love you, and, 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 and we just are so grateful for all that you're doing for us. And so, and so they, would bring, they would bring their gifts. And the Bible says that Cain brought some of his produce. He obviously worked, you know, with, with produce and, 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 and tomato plants or whatever else, fruit, vegetables, whatever. Whereas 
Abel, on the other hand, took care of flocks. He raised flocks. Abel, the Bible says, took the choice, the choice lambs, the choice from his flock, and he sacrificed them before the Lord. And that when the Lord came to look and to see their gratefulness, it says he looked at Cain and was like, dude, you, you just gave me a tip. What, what, what's the deal? And he looked at Abel and he said, oh, you gave from a place or you don't even have enough to get, you, oh my goodness. He says, and he looked upon him with favor. And then what happened was Cain looks over at Abel and he has jealousy and hatred in his heart. The first murder recorded in the history of humanity was not a man defending his family against an attacking man. It was not a man who, 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 who his child was molested by somebody else. And so he went and killed that dude. The first murder in the history of humanity was the result of one brother being jealous of another brother because he was disobedient, because he was stingy, because he was ungrateful. And that one over there was righteous before the Lord. God counted it as righteous. And he said, I'm going to remove that from this planet. I'm going to kill him for it. That's the first murder. It was generated out of jealousy and selfish ambition, out of greed, because this man, and actually in that passage, if you go back and read it, God actually said, why are you upset, Cain? If you do what's right, why are you upset? See, faith is giving even when you don't have it. Giving your love. So I don't even have any love to give to these kids right now, what I've been through. Faith is giving that love even when you don't have it. Faith is giving of that time to go connect with those other people in small group, even when you say, I don't have a lot of time. I don't have, that's faith. But I know that if I give of my time to be with these people, it will strengthen me. I know that if I put that seed in the ground, if I make that effort, if I make, even though I don't feel like I have, to, have it to give, if I give that, that, there will be a recompense for that. That's called faith. That's what Abel did. He gave even though he didn't have a whole lot to give. You still with me? Say yes. Boy, y'all get nervous when the Bible talks about money. Here's number three. Number, actually, number four. Number four, faith is persisting when I don't feel like it. Faith is persisting even when I don't feel like it. See, culture says, base your decisions on how you feel. Ah, I don't really feel like doing this anymore. I don't really want to, I don't feel like getting up. I don't, I don't feel like doing it. I don't, but, but really what we see if we base our decisions on the way we feel, then what happens is that, that we are then manipulated by our emotions. You're manipulated by your moods. As a mature Christian, I make my decisions based on the commitments I've made. I've committed to the Lord. He says do this, I do that. He says don't do this, I don't do that. Doesn't matter how I feel. That's what a mature Christian does. That's why we've got to grow in our faith. Because some of you are still making all your decisions by way. So, yeah, I just feel like the Lord wants me to do this. Yeah, but that's not what he says in the Bible. So are you committed to your feelings or are you committed to him? We got, we, we got to, and, and, and so faith, what it does is it, it's persisting even though I don't feel like it. Look at Hebrews eleven twenty seven 27, talking about Moses. It says, by faith, Moses, he left Egypt without fearing the king's anger. For he, pers he, he persevered as though he could see the one who was invisible. So Moses said, listen, he goes to the king, the Pharaoh, and says, God says, let my people go. He said, I ain't doing it. You know Moses didn't want to do it. When you read the passage, the Bible says that Moses said, Lord, I, I got a stu 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 stuttering pr 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 problem. I can't be the one. I, 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 I can't. He says, take Aaron with you. He'll help you. Oh, man. <laughs> so he takes Aaron with him. And it's amazing. We don't even hear Aaron talking. Moses does all the talking. God fixes it supernaturally somehow. When you face your fear, it's amazing how the problems will just kind of alleviate. Day in, day out, he goes back to says, sir, you've already had plague number three. Do you really want to get to plague number four? But he keeps persisting. Pharaoh says, I'm not going to let him go. I'm not going to let him go. He keeps persisting. Then he gets the children of Israel out of Egypt, and then he's got to deal with them all out in the wilderness. And the Bible teaches us that Moses had faith because he knew that there was a promised land waiting for them. He faithed the promised land before they ever got, and he was persistent for 40 years to get them there. He was persistent for 40 years. Can I just tell you something? Faith is you being persistent. Say, you know what? He ain't serving God yet, but I'm praying for him every day. I'm not going to stop praying. I'm not quitting. I'm going to keep going to church and asking him if he wants to go even if he don't go. A year after year, he's told me he's not going to go, but I'm going to be persistent. I'm going to believe in God that that adult child of mine is coming back to Jesus day in and day out. I'm not quitting on it. I'm not quitting on the word. I'm not quitting on, on, on being faithful. I'm going to be persistent. Faith is persisting even when I don't feel like it. That's what faith looks like. We just had this amazing time with the men. Grit. Our staff was wore out from the summer. We were tired. 
We've been doing cough days of summer. Y'all had all these problems. We try and help y'all fix it. It just wore out, man. We're just tired. But we said, our men need some time together. Our men need some time with the Lord that we need. We're going into a new school year. We've only got four or five months left in the year. We need each other. And so our team gritted it out. And we persisted, even though, man, it was hard to put this thing together. It was a lot of work. I mean, we were having meetings on top of meetings to try to get this. And then, and then you know, the mechanical bull guys canceled on us, and we had to find somebody else, and all this kind of stuff was back and forth. Persistent, staying faithful in that belief that God will accomplish what he said he would accomplish. Are you still there? Say yes. So you know that old saying says, if you focus on the problem, you'll be distressed. If you focus on you, then you'll end up depressed. But if you'll focus on Jesus, you'll be at rest. See, just, just be persistent. I'm going to keep focusing on I felt like Joel Osteen there. And you focus on Jesus, you'll just be at rest. But, but you will. If you'll put your eyes back on him and just stay focused, just, I'm going to keep being persistent with Jesus, then you'll be at rest. Number five, they already got it on the screen. Number five, faith is thanking God before you ever receive it. Faith is thanking God before you ever receive it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30. Look at verse 30. It says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell after. Everybody say after. After After the people had marched around them for seven days. Okay, some of you don't know the storyline there, so let me just tell you what happened. Uh, God had given the people of Israel, he had given them their, if you will, this land. And then in their rebellion, because they stopped serving God, They ended up being captured by another nation and then stripped away from their land. They were stolen from their land. They were exiled, if you will. And then they were obviously in Egypt for 500 years. And so Moses gets them out of Egypt, and God's going to bring them back to their land. Well, guess what's happened over 500 years? Other people moved into that place. Never mind, it's their land. But, But the problem is, is that God's not limited to this year, next year. God sees all things. And so his time base is totally different. And so the children of Israel come back and say, we want our land back. And those people are like, no, you ain't getting it back. It's our land. And there's a particular city, Jericho. And Jericho, over 100 years, had plenty of time to build up a a massive wall around their city. It was, uh, of the ancient times, one of the greatest defensive uh, walls ever ever built. And so so when they get to it, God says, now, you're going to believe in me because you can't can't beat them. They got a wall around them. And uh, not only that, you've been slaves for 500 years, so... You don't even really know how to fight. You don't even really have that good of an established army. And they said, Lord, we'll believe in you. He says, okay, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to march around it every day, one time around it, silently. I want you to, just, I want you to get the worship leaders out there. I want you to get the warriors. I just want you to war, mark, march around it silently. So can you imagine? They start into that first day. See how awkward it was for silence just right here? It took them a few hours to march around this thing. Now imagine the guys on the wall. Imagine their enemies, the Jerichoans, if you will. Like, dude, what's wrong with you, you mute? <laughs> hey, you can't hear me, stupid? Get a little closer. We got something for you. Because, you know, they would always throw, you know, poop over the side. You know, they horse poop and cow poop and stuff. Get a little closer over here. <laughs> and you know they're laughing. I'm make- and if you're a warrior like I am, Did you hear what that joker just said? Talked about my mama. Did you talk about my mama? Second day, march around it in silence. Third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. They, six days they march around this thing in silence. And they get to the seventh day and God says, okay, now this time, I want you to march around it for seven times. Who knows? It probably took them all day. Because you, you, you got tens of thousands of people marching in line around a city. And so they marched around the city, and he said, and on the last one, I want you to shout. I want you to shout. So Hebrews is referring back to that. It says, and by faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. They marched around the seventh time on the seventh day, and they shout, Jehovah is God! Woo! And all of a sudden, the walls started going... And history tells us the walls didn't push inward, they came outward. As if something exploded in the middle of that city and blew the walls out like that. I'll tell you who the something was. His name is Jesus. I'm telling you right now. Boom, blew the walls out. So all the guys on the wall are dead because they've just fallen, you know, and crumbled, you know, like an earthquake, you know, from four stories up or however high it was. And they're all dead. And so they just march in and destroy the place and take over. But the point is this. 
Nothing happened until they first started thanking God in advance before it had ever happened. And you've got to understand this. Faith is thanking God in advance and believing that he's going to do it before he ever does it. See, gratitude is when you say, thank you, Jesus, for doing that. Thank you so much. That's gratitude. That's not faith. Once you've already gotten the job, and you say, oh, I thank you. You go to church, I got a new job. God, you're so good. You're so... That's great. That's gratitude. That's gratitude. But that's not faith. Faith is before you ever get that job. Lord, I thank you. You got a job waiting for me. I thank you got the perfect job waiting for me. Lord, I in advance declare that you are good and that you got me in the palm of your hand. Lord, I believe, Lord God, even though I don't see it, Lord, I am thanking you for that in advance before it, they shouted in advance before the wall ever came down. What if the wall didn't come? Yeah! Cricket. Cricket. See, faith is thanking God before I ever receive it. God, I thank you that my son's going to serve God with all of his heart. I know what he's doing right now, but I thank God in advance that you're going to grab his heart and turn him back, that you're going to protect him from losing his life. Lord, I thank you right now. Lord, I thank you so much. You are so good. I thank you that I'll not always live in this situation, that you've got a better plan for me, that, Lord, I'll have my own house one day. I thank you, God. I know that you are faithful and just. And, Lord God, when we ask, we shall receive. I thank you in advance. I believe that you are at work in my life. That's faith. Are you with me? Say yes. Oh, uh, you're doing pretty good. Let's go to number six. Last one. Here we go. Faith is trusting God even if I do not get what I'm believing for. Now, this one's going to make you mad, but that's okay. Just buckle up for a second. Faith is trusting God even if I don't get what I'm believing for. I want to teach you something that you're not going to like, but it's true. God hears and answers every single prayer. Wait for it. That ain't true. My grandmother died, and I pray that she wouldn't. No, God answers and hears every single prayer. Now, let me help you with that. God does not always answer it the way you want it to be answered. Sometimes God's answer is no. He heard it. No. Sometimes his answer is yes. Sometimes he's like, are you crazy? You lost your mind. Sometimes his answer is not yet. And sometimes his answer is, I got something better. That's how you are as a parent, those of us that are parents. Every time my four-year-old wanted something, I didn't give it to them. Dad, can we? No, we ain't doing it. You lost your mind. That's coming from your mom's side. We would have never asked that from the McCain side. Are you crazy? Is it? Oh, get up. Think about that. And sometimes my answer was, oh, yeah, we doing that, baby. We are going to Six Flags. Let's go right now. Yes! And they're like, yes! Yeah! And sometimes it's like, we will do that, but not yet. Not yet. And sometimes it's like, baby, we're not going to do that, but there's something better. We're going to do this because this is who we are. So God always hears and he always answers prayers. So it's not always the way you want it. See, God cares more about developing your character than giving you what you want. God cares more about developing your righteousness than he does about making you feel good. See, we live in a culture, if you don't make me feel good, I watched this parent on an airplane the other day. She was more concerned about that kid feeling good than she was about developing his character. So he kept kicking my seat. And she didn't want to make him mad. I was like, I can fix this whole thing. Give me five minutes. I don't even need that. I need 90 seconds. Put the fear of God in that young man. What's he going he gonna, to he gonna keep kicking people, all right? Kicking himself right on into prison. Why? Because she was more concerned about right now, right here, instead of what he will be when he's 16, when he's 30, when he's 50. God cares about you, not right here, right now. He cares about you all throughout your whole life. He's not just concerned. Yes, he cares about this. Don't misunderstand me. But he's not just worried about that. He doesn't just have this in mind. He sees. See, we think we're so linear. We just think start, stop, one little line of our life. Boom, 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 boom. I'm right here on this. I'm on this part of the highway. I'm on mile marker 17. Oh, my God. Will I ever get to mile marker 3,000? Oh, my life is sucks. And God's like, you'll get there, I promise you. Because I can see all that all the way through. I can see all that all the way through. So what you want may not be what you need. Just like you would tell your own children. You don't dis disregard them. You care about them. And God cares about you. And so you and I have to learn that faith is trusting him even when I don't get what I'm believing for. When you read the end of Hebrews chapter 11, he begins listing out these people. He said, well, I don't even have time to tell you about 
Barak. And I don't even have time to tell you about, you know, what Gideon and, 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 and David and Samuel and these other pieces. And then he goes into, and then what about those? What about those who were sacrificed? What about those who they murdered? What about those, he said, he said, he said what about those that were cut in two? What about those who had to live in hiding? What about those guys? And this is what he says about them. The Lord says about them in Hebrews 38. He says, the world was not worthy of them. The world was not worthy of them. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. They cried out for God to do miracles in this particular area. They walked in faith. Many of them were tortured, early church, for believing in Jesus. Many of them were imprisoned and done dirty. Do you think that was their prayer every day? Lord, I just thank you that I'm being done dirty. Lord, more dirtiness to me. No, their prayer was a prayer of deliverance. Oh, God, deliver me out of this. Oh, God, deliver me out of this. And the word says that their prayers didn't, it, it didn't, they didn't even see what was promised them. They had promises that these things, they didn't see it. But the world is not worthy of them because they are such people of faith. Can I just help you with something? You may not see it in your lifetime. His promises are yes and amen. It may not happen the way you thought it was going to happen, but God's going to get it done. Don't let your faith be stolen. Become a person that your faith is dangerous to the enemy. And he looks and he goes, my goodness, no matter what I tell him, he keeps persisting in faith. No matter what I do to him, he keeps looking up and saying, God is good. God's got this in the palm of his hand. Even though his prayers are not getting answered right now, he won't stop. That's dangerous to the enemy. See, it's dangerous to an enemy when you and I say, Lord, I declare that you're going to bring my son back to God before it ever even happens. That's dangerous. How do you fight a person like that? How do you fight a person that you're knocking down and he gets back up? How do you fight a person that you're kicking while he's down and he just don't, he doesn't stop smiling? That's dangerous to an enemy. That's why we're calling this dangerous faith. You got to become a man and woman of faith. That your faith, Jesus said it like this. He called it only twice in scripture. He said, great faith. And none of those guys had grown up, if you will, following Jehovah God. In scripture, we see these two people that he called it great faith. None, neither one of them were Jews. One was a centurion. The centurion said to him, he said, sir, my daughter is dying. And I need you to come. And Jesus was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then he got interrupted. He came back. He said, sir, he sent a message back. He said, sir, don't even come. You just speak the word and it'll happen. And Jesus went, what just happened? What just happened? He's looking at all these other people like, what's wrong with all of y'all? He said, this is great faith. Great faith. He said, you don't even have to come. Just say it. And in that moment, that daughter was healed. Great faith. I want to raise up men and women of great faith. In this next six weeks, don't miss a Sunday. I promise you. Yes, you can hear it online. You can listen to it later. But something is imparted when we're together. I want to see you heal the sick, raise the dead. I want to see you persisting and being consistent like Moses out there in the wilderness, even though it doesn't feel good, even though you don't like the way it looks. I want to see you declaring and seeing, your, seeing these miracles happen all around you because you stood in faith and declared it before it ever even transpired, owned it, even though it didn't happen the way you wanted it to, and say, you know, it didn't happen the way I wanted it to, but God's still in control. God is still good. My wife is one of the greatest examples of this last point. She stretched out. She said, God, I'll do it. You asked me to run for mayor, I'll run for mayor. She stood there at the batter's box. She swung for the fence and we lost by 66 votes. And for the last couple weeks I've watched her. She dusted herself off and she said, God is still good and I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to keep loving Jesus. She didn't get what she asked for. She didn't get what she was believing for, but she didn't stop faithing in the living God. Are you with me today? Say yes. Great faith. That's who you're going to be. Men and women of dangerous faith pushing the enemy back. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. The violent Men and women, push it forward. Push it forward. Would you stand with me all across the room today? Great faith. Dangerous faith. The kind of faith that's believing when I don't see it. Dangerous faith. Faith is obeying when I don't understand it. Some of you are going through some things, you're like, I don't understand it. Keep faith. In. It's increasing your faith. Giving when I don't have it to give. Keep giving.
Keep giving your love. Keep giving your affection. Persisting when I don't feel like it. Keep being a man or woman of faith. That's developing great faith. Thanking God before I receive it. And trusting God even when I don't get what I was believing for. I want you to close your eyes with me across the room today. Where have you suffered in your faith? Where have you been weak faith? Have you had a hard time seeing it? Nothing great has ever happened around the planet that someone didn't see it and then go out and do it. Where have you been blinded and, and you struggled to see that God is good? Where have you lacked faith in him? Maybe for you, you lack faith that your babies are going to live because you've had a couple miscarriages. Come back to faith. Maybe you struggle to believe that God can help you overcome this weakness in your life because you keep falling to it. Come back to faith. Persistent. Faith is persistence. Maybe, maybe you've gotten to the place where you've been believing and it hadn't happened the way you would believe, you've been believing. What if today you just for a moment stepped into a deeper, deeper level of faith and said, God, I'm yours no matter what happens. Even if it doesn't go the way I thought it should go, even though it hadn't happened the way I wanted it to happen, I'm yours. However you want it to happen, I'm yours. What if you came to that place? Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Just take a moment and move into a place. Lean into God for a moment. I have you close your eyes and bow your head so you can lean into him without being distracted. Jesus, as a church, we come before you. Lord God, we recognize we have faith, but we don't have dangerous faith yet. We want to move forward. Jesus, we want to be the men and women that, Lord God, all of the pit of hell is scared of. God, we want to be the men and women that you say that's dangerous faith that they walk in, our great faith. God, I pray right now that you would start something here now. We've got six weeks of learning and growing and maturing and stretching. God, there's going to be some awkwardness. Lord God, there's going to be some frustration moments. There's going to be some testings. And God, I pray right now in Jesus' name that men and women here now would determine to be people of faith. Either you're God or not, either our Savior or not. And Lord, for those who become wore out, they've struggled to continue to trust, I pray right now for a fresh wind of hope into their spiritual lungs. Jesus, I ask you right now, to heal and help the person who's been on the edge of giving up. In Jesus' name. There's some of you been on the edge of giving up, believing that God cares, believing that something's gonna change. And this message was for you. He's telling you, don't give up. Stay in faith. Stay in faith. Stay in faith. But it's been so long. Stay in faith. Stay in faith. What if it didn't happen in my lifetime? Stay in faith. Father, I thank you right now for peace. And I thank you, Lord, for a radical, risk it faith. Lord, that men and women in this church would stop praying sissy prayers and start praying faith prayers, risky prayers. God, that they'd start believing risky things, things that, things that like others are going to say, what are you doing? Like, that's way outside of your ability. Exactly. If you have the ability to do it, it doesn't take faith. If you have the ability to accomplish it in your own strength, it doesn't require faith. If, you, if they could have knocked down the wall of Jericho, they wouldn't even have marched around. It wouldn't have taken faith. God, I pray right now for a revelation of what faith is so that we can journey this together and become men and women of great faith. Every head bowed, every eye closed, every hand down. I want to give a couple moments to call for anyone who say, Pastor, i got to be honest, I'm not a Christian. If I died today, I wouldn't go to heaven. I'd like to call for anyone who say, Pastor, I, I, you know, I, I used to be a Christian. I just, stuff happened, life happened. I'm, but I feel like I'm like separated from God, maybe even divorced. Friend, I know that. I know what that's like. I've been in that space. But I got such good news for you. God's not mad at you. And you can't be too bad off. You came here today. And think about that. Nobody tricked you. You didn't think you were coming to a club. You knew you were going to church. You knew that you were going to have to think about and, and confront the fact that you're away from God or that you've never been a Christian. So that means something in your heart longs for God. If I had to guess, shame has kept you from him. If I had to guess, 
you probably feel guilty because you had done it all right over the years. And you're thinking, if I do it right, then I can come to God. And that doesn't work. You don't catch a clean fish. You catch a fish and then you clean it. And God, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to be good. And so today, the solution to your problem is found in this scripture. It says, if you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, that he will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In other words, he teaches us to be saved, to be right with him. We don't have to give money to the church. We don't have to perform righteous acts. We don't have to crawl on our knees and beg and plead. He said, man, that sounds so simple. Just ask. Yeah. Because all the heavy lifting was done 2,000 years ago on a cross. Jesus did that so you don't have to die in your sin. In fact, if you could understand this, Every sin you will ever commit, every man in the history of humanity, for the last 2,000 years, every sin you ever committed, Jesus paid for on that cross. He, he paid it forward. I tell people like this, like there's an account with your name on it, and everything has already been paid for. You say, oh, ooh, that's awesome. How do I access that? Well, I just told you, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. See, that confession and believing... See, that's an illustration of someone who's coming into relationship. You've become best friends with Jesus with that confessing and believing. And then he starts working out all the other junk out of us. So today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're away from God, if you've not been serving the Lord and you want to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you want to declare him as your God, if you want to submit yourself to his Lordship, I'd like to pray with you. I'm not going to call you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. But I want to point you out. But I do need you to admit it to yourself and have courage to make a stand that you're ready for God. So no one's looking. Just me, you, and heaven. If you say, Pastor, that's me. It's time. I'm ready to get right with God. I want to pray out. I want to ask God into my life. No one looking around. If that's you, would you just lift your hand? I want to know who I'm praying with right now. Across this room. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? Give you three, three, four seconds. Okay, thank you, sir. It's time, Pastor. I don't want to live like this anymore. Thank you, bro. I see you put it back down. I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to be away from God. I want God in my life. I want to ask him to forgive me of my sins. I want to become his. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Two or three more seconds. Come on. That's you. Don't, don't hesitate. Hesitating is making it. Thank you, sir. Not a non-decision is a decision. You're saying, I don't really want that. Because if you want something, you go get it. Anyone else? A couple more seconds. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Amen. That's it. You can put your hands down. I'm going to lead you in that prayer, that prayer of repentance, that prayer of dedication. In fact, I I want you to say it out loud. I want you to mean it from your heart. Those of you who lifted your hand, don't let this moment pass. You mean it with all of your heart. And those of you who, who, who are in the congregation, would you pray out loud alongside of these and, and repeat this prayer with us? Say it like this. Say, Jesus, today I admit I'm a sinner. And I know I've sinned against you. But I ask you now to forgive me. Wash me clean. I accept what you did on the cross. Jesus, I declare... You are my Lord and my Savior. I accept your love. I accept your forgiveness. I ask you now, write my name in your book of life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I'm yours forever. In Jesus' name. Keep your head bowed for just a moment. Father, I pray for every man and woman who cried out to you in this holy moment. I thank you right now that the peace, it's hard to explain, the peace of God will just begin to wrap around them right now. And then the word calls it the joy of their salvation. Right now, the elephant's gone. It's out of the room. They've dealt with it. They're right with you. They, they don't have to perform. You did it in a holy moment 2,000 years ago. And they get to receive it now. And Jesus, I pray right now, peace would come over them. Joy would come over them. Down in their internal parts. <laughs> a giggle that says, you know what? I may not be perfect, but I'm forgiven. And Lord, when they go forward into this week and maybe they stumble and fall and do some stupid stuff, sin, whatever, they'll get back up and say, you know what? <laughs> I may not got it all together yet, but I'm his son. I'm his daughter. I'm in the family of God. And I have been accepted and my sins have been rejected and forgiven is on my name. Father, thank you for what you've done here today in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. For every one of you that made that, that made that decision and cried out to God, I want to welcome you into the family of God. Welcome. God bless you.